Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's Mike here at Game From Scratch and welcome back to the ongoing Godot tutorial series. In the last one we looked at how to create shaders using Godot. Today we're going to look at how to create visual shaders. Now a bit of a warning up front, I'm using Godot 3.2 beta for this video simply because the visual shader programming got a whole lot better in 3.2. So hopefully it is released any day now, but if you're following this in the very, very near future, unfortunately you need to use 3.2 to get this functionality to work as I'm demonstrating it. All right, disclaimer out of the way, let's jump in and take a look. So we're gonna go ahead and create a scene, a 3D scene. We need something to work on. So we're just gonna go ahead and create a mesh instance like that guy. Uh, I did not create him, not sure what happened there. All right, so mesh instance. All right, so we've got this guy. We're just gonna create it as a sphere. Sphere is created, ah, there you go, looks good. Now what we're gonna do is go ahead obviously and create our material. Drop down material, go here, and what we're going to create is a shader material like so, and then you can click or you can drop down the arrow and click edit. So now that we've got our shader, we need to pick our type. And at this point in time, we've got normal shaders or visual shaders. Now the cool thing about a visual shader is it can actually be converted into a normal shader at any time, but you can't go the opposite direction. So this is actually a good way to get your feet wet when you're learning how to create shaders. So let's do that. We'll go ahead, create a new visual shader. And then once again, you could just click that to bring up the editor, or you can click the drop down and go to edit. And here is the result. You'll see you get a number of outputs with pins on their left. Those are inputs to this output. The final result of every shader is an output. There are three kinds of shaders in Godot. There's fragment shaders, which you can think of as pixel shaders. These determine the texture, sorry, the color of the result of the rendering. Uh, they are run for every single potential pixel that is shown in the scene. We've got vertex shaders. These are run on every single vertex in your object. And these are used for, uh, you know, you can calculate the normals, UV mapping, or you can do, um, you know, manipulations to the physical position of objects using a vertex shader. And then finally, there's a light shader, which you can use for setting the diffuse and specular lighting details. In this particular case, we're going to deal with fragment first and then vertex shaders. Lighting shaders are a bit less common, and I think they're also going to change quite heavily in Godot 4. So anyways, here we are back here. So we've got our fragment shader. This again is for determining the, the pixel outputs from the shader result. And let's look at kind of as simple as it gets. So here you can see the output, all the stuff you normally see in a PBR workflow is there. Uh, albedo, alpha, metallic, roughness, uh, ambient occlusion, normal maps, so on. And you can use as few or as many as you wish. You could just basically set up here a color and drop it out to the albedo channel and call it a day. So what we're going to do, and this is a new feature to 3.2, so we'll just drop a texture in here. You'll see it is a texture. We could say, okay, use the color data from this guy. We can click this little eyeball and preview what the end results are gonna be looking like. But you'll see here, pink pin, pink pin. Pink likes pink. So we basically drag that pin out to there, and there you will see our shape is now textured on our object. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy, pretty clean so far. So that is how you go about applying a texture. The nice thing about the surface, middle mouse button to pan around, um, wheel to zoom up and down, control, oh no, sorry, it's right here, plus and minus to zoom in and out. I do wish the control wheel did that. It doesn't, I don't know why. Anyways, here we saw, so we've got our texture came in to connect that channel up to the output color channel. Another very common thing would be to do something like define a normal map. So we'll bring this guy in like so. I don't know why the coloration is weird because that's not what it actually looks like. We'll switch this one over so that it is a normal map like so. And we will drop the RGB channel into the normal map channel. And there you see our, our geometry is, uh, or the lighting model, it pretends like there's more geometry to the scene than there is. Now what we might have wanted to do in this particular case is have it tiled a bit. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna tile this so we have more detail on our normal map on our object over here. And that is done via a couple things. First off, we need to handle an input. Inputs are defined under the input class. You notice I just basically right clicked over here to bring this up. You can also do this via add node. And then we'll click input. This creates a new input node like voila. And you will see there are a number of things being passed into your shader. These are all being passed in by Godot. Things like where your camera is, projection matrix, the current time. Uh, and then in this particular case, specific to uh, fragment shaders, you can see like the UVs, the normals, uh, the vertex position and so on. I was gonna take the UV and then what I'm going to do is drop this pin out. When you drop a pin out, it will automatically create a new node from it as well and then connect it. And what we want to do is a vector op, uh, like so. So you can see pink means vectors. And we're going to do a multiply. So you drop that down. You, obviously, you can see there's multiple operations you could do on a vector. We will do a multiply. And down here, we will set it to 5, 
and the X, five in the Y, and then one in the Z. Now, unfortunately, with these little pop-up dialogues, you have to hit enter for them to commit. It's very irritating. I don't know why that feature functionality is there, but that is the case. So there is the multiplication. So we're gonna tile our UVs by five by five on the, the uh, X and Y axis, and then we're gonna dump that into the UV here. And then you see immediately updates, and now we have a Chesterfield look going on with our guy over here. Pretty clean, pretty cool, pretty straightforward so far. Now let's throw another little neat feature that we can do here. So, so far, we just have this texture straight up coming into our output for our Elbado channel, but let's say we wanted to tint it. So we are going to do exactly that. So we're gonna add the ability to do a tint, but the coolest thing is we're actually gonna do this in a way that it exposes it out to the editor. So first thing we're gonna need is a variable. These are called uniforms in Shader Speak. So we need a uniform. You're gonna see there's a ton of different kinds of uniforms, scalars, uh, booleans, vectors, so on. But what we want is a color uniform, like so. And we can just come in and straight up define the color right here, but we're actually gonna do something kind of cooler. Uh, so we're gonna call this guy tint color. And I'm gonna spell that like a proper Englishman. All right, so, so tint color, you notice it automatically put that uh, the underscore in there, so I didn't create an illegal variable. And now what we are going to do is another vector op. You do a lot of vector opping, by the way. And we're going to just basically add the tint to our texture. So we drop this guy over here. So this guy into here, this guy into here, and then we'll pin this guy into here instead. So there you see, all we've got is this little tint value that we can now add on to the RGB channel that's coming out from our original texture. And if we head on back up over here, we go back a couple, it's back to our uh, shader material. You'll notice we now have shader params. And what I can do is drop that down and we can add a tint. So this gives you the ability in your shaders to easily add um, like a programmable layer to it so that a designer in your game can make updates and your shader, they don't have to jump into the shader code to deal with anything. And that's a cool thing about uniforms. They're basically exposed variables that you can use at your will. So that was kind of that. Let me, before we move on, I'm gonna tint this guy to say blue so it looks a little bit better. There we go. So we have a cushion, couch cushioned, plushy version of the Godot logo. Now what we're going to do is jump on over to the vertex shaders. Now the vertex shaders, once again, so just head on back over here to your visual shader, brings your interface back up and let's switch to vertex like so. And this process is actually almost identical, but the thing is instead of having the output being things like colors and, and so on, here it's positions. Although ironically, you can also set the color of the vertex, but we're not getting into that. All right, so in this particular case, we're gonna do something a little, I don't know, fun. So we're gonna start off, again, we're gonna go back to the inputs. So the inputs that are available for a vertex shader are completely different than they were for the fragment shader. There are some things in common, some things that are completely different. So what we're going to start with here is the time. So come over here, we got the time of day. So this is the time being passed into the shader. And now we're going to take that time and we are going to uh, scalar function, so we're dealing with a scalar, that's why you can tell with that blue, and again, the, the color will, will correspond right there. So we wanna do a function on that guy, and we're going to do the sin of it. All right, and now what we need to do is create a new vector. So we're going to literally compose a new vector, which you use vector compose to do this. We're creating a new vector out of nothingness, and this vector is going to be value one, one, and then what we're gonna do is vary, oops, we're gonna vary the Z value or Z value over time, right there. So we're setting our Z value based off the sine value of the current time. It's basically gonna warble. We'll see that in a second. So now we've got uh, this vector that we can um, multiply by, but we don't have anything to multiply it by. So we're gonna go back to our good old fashioned input right here, and instead, we're gonna start with the actual position of the vector. So there, see, it's right there, the vertex position, like so. I'm gonna drag that one out. And that one is going to be a vector operation. So vector op, like so. And that's going to be a multiply. And we're gonna multiply by our randomly warbling Z axis value, like that. And then this will ultimately connect to the vertex on the output. And you'll immediately see the results when I drop this pin in. Like right, boom, there you go. So there you can see over time, we are warping at the Z axis. Very kind of useless shader, but it is probably the most 
uh, minimal example I could think of that kind of illustrated what you can do with both, how to set up inputs, how to deal with uh, parameters that you can define yourself. And it, it kind of does also showcase some of the power that is available to you. And of course you're seeing both of these shaders work together. So obviously we can still play with and change around the fragment shader behind the scenes. Um, and you could just kind of keep adding to the complication here. Now at the same time, I've only been using a select bit. So we can come down here, you see the full scope of what is available to you. Let me just expand this out a bit. So, so you see you've got colors and you've got various different functions that are available. So if you want to convert something to Cepheid, you can, for example. You've got conditions for your logic, if, if not less than, equal to, that kind of stuff. Um, they just added a switch. I believe that's a 3.2 feature. Again, we saw the input that you could deal with. Um, you can straight up use values. Like if I just needed to go to the camera, we can have it automatically launch the camera instead of having to create an input and then drilling down to it. So you see, you've got all kinds of stuff here and you've even got some special stuff if you're feeling special. And this one is actually kind of cool. So if you've got a straight out shader that you want to run, you can use these two guys here, global expression and expression. You can actually just drop code and so you can add inputs into them that are being passed in. And then you can literally just straight out start typing code into this box. Another really neat thing with this guy is um, in 3.2 at least, you can now grab a chunk of things like that. I did a control C and then you can paste them like that. You can also multi-select and delete. So it's just so much nicer to work with this guy than it used to be. And the one final thing I'm gonna showcase before moving on, and this works for both vertex and fragment shaders. So I told you earlier on that you can convert them at will and you can. So if you're in the shader section, so if you're in the visual shader, uh, you can, oh no, sorry, here, you drop down the shader, you can say convert to shader. So you can turn a visual shader into a text shader at any time. But even cooler, you don't even really have to do that. Here you can see we're in the vertex shader right here. See this guy right here? I can just click it and it will actually show us the code that's being generated on the fly. So if you start adding nodes, it will change on the fly. So if you had a new, um, if we added a new input or whatever, it would immediately show up at the top here. Um, and this also applies for our fragment shader. So as we were creating it, here is the code that it was, it's actually generating both in the same spot. So you see here, there's the fragment shader that's generated and there is the vertex shader that's generated. And then there is the light shader. I didn't use it all. And here are the parameters that we are passing in and out. So you'll see one of these is going to be, there's our hint, for example, very, very cool stuff. So it, it's definitely a powerful set of features. You can expose functions out. It's a nice way to get, you know, familiar with how shaders work without having to actually dump in and figure out how to script. So actually, while I don't really recommend the Godot visual programming language as it stands right now, the visual shader language is absolutely excellent. And I encourage you to jump in and play around with it. But if you do do so, do it with 3.2. The experience is just so much nicer. Uh, now, obviously I'm not going to get into shaders themselves. That is a gigantic subject. That could be, it's an own entire tutorial series. But what I would recommend you to do if you're new to shaders is go check out Shader Toy. It'll give you an idea of just what you're capable of. And the, the process of converting over from this over to the visual options, it, it's actually more intuitive than you think. So adapting things to a visual shader is on the whole a pretty straightforward process. All right, that's it for the tutorial. Hopefully you guys found that useful. Hopefully you like visual shader programming in Godot. I do actually like it quite a bit now with the new 3.2 improvement. It, it just makes it kind of a joy to work with. All right, let me know what you think. Comments down below and I will talk to you all later. Goodbye.